Sunday of Advent, our first day, 347, comfort, comfort, Lord. Just be deserve your present and eternal punishment for the sake of your Son, 
Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be right in your will, and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our appointed psalm for today is Psalm 85. We shall speak it responsibly, full of responsibility. <coughs>
Lord is coming, he may be able to serve you, my dear Lord. He is King Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
Our epistle comes from 2 Peter chapter 3. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient to it, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by Him without spot of blemish and at peace. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Peace be us.
grace, peace, and mercy from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated.
from extra biblical sources. And Isaiah is not the only prophet who talks about the people of Israel, their exile. He does not even talk about the comfort that is coming. But between that 200 year period, in 722, we know the northern kingdom fell to the Syrians. And the prophet Jonah, he prophesied against the great city of Nineveh. They repented the first time. But finally, in 612 BC, under the great sin, the city collapsed. And not only the city, but also the kingdom of the Assyrians collapsed. Josiah, the king, died in the battle of Megiddo, 609 BC. And then this new empire, the Babylonian Empire, comes in. We all know of this king, Nebuchadnezzar. He brings total anarchy into Judah. He comes in, Jerusalem is completely devastated, destroyed in 587 BC. The temple is destroyed just to prove in that limited 200 year history what Isaiah was saying, Isaiah 39, 5 to 7, how that plays out. See, Nebuchadnezzar's forces destroy Jerusalem. They bring the leaders, they carry all of the Israelites out of their country and then they become exiles again. The Babylonian captivity. But even before all of this happens, way back in 740, Isaiah's words of comfort come. You see, before you see, if you read Isaiah 39 and go to Isaiah 40, you will see that there is an unnatural break in the language. The language that had been flowing beautifully suddenly breaks. And then this lesson from today comes in. It's a moment of quiet. It's a moment of silence before the voice in wilderness will proclaim the coming of the Messiah. And we can see it reflected in the silent period. We call it this 400 years of history of the Israelite people when there was no prophecy until John, the son of Zechariah, comes along. And that same silence of the 400 years is accentuated in the silence of Zechariah due to his unbelief until his tongue is loosed by the writing of his son's name, John, the heretic. And so St. John comes along. Before we get to that, I know you see, the church is in a very awkward position these days. The first position is that the church has to stand for, for the word of God, surely. But the church also now has to start teaching grammar, because grammar has been, uh, well, taken captive. And so today we will talk about, we talked about the metaphor last time, but today we talk about another literary device called the metonymy. I remember way back when really grammar was being taught in schools, metonymy. It is a figure of speech where an object or a concept is placed in such a way that it would explain the larger concept. So in this case, Isaiah, writing, oh, 740 BC, knows these kind of things, right? He was not a foolish man. No, he is called the mighty seer of God. And so he uses a literary device called metonymy. He places the overarching theme of the coming of the Lord Jesus and his deliverance from sin by pointing to the deliverance under Cyrus from exile. So metonymy of Cyrus with the overarching theme of Jesus. And you will be uh, glad to know that the word used for Cyrus in the Bible is my Messiah, my anointed one, Cyrus. Shall deliver my people. That's strange for God to be using the word Messiah for a person who is not of Jewish descent, another a king who is from another place. But again, the idea of metonymy, the deliverance from exile pointing to Isaiah as a type of Christ, pointing to the deliverance from sin and every evil, the antipite being Christ, and especially when he talks about the vanquishing of all things by death. Pointing to the completion of the greater prophecy of, the, of Isaiah as he writes, which begins with the virgin bearing the holy child. The details keep getting filled throughout this book of Isaiah. We know about Christ as a suffering servant. We know finally until St. John comes and illuminates 
Isaiah 53 properly for us. The Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. And so, metonymy. Again, you know, when, when people graduate from seminary, they kind of all use all kinds of different languages. The point being, we're all pointing us to the Lamb of God. And Isaiah is using these devices to teach us the truth. St. John is the same voice that Isaiah prophesied. He says that Cyrus shall come. He will, by, you see, God by his divine providence, he guides the hands of the rulers. And so he uses Cyrus first to reestablish the temple, the temple which has been destroyed. And then second, that he would invigorate the people in the hope of their deliverance. That looking at the temple and the sacrificial system, they would remember the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. This Lamb of the God, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now Isaiah leaves in all of history, the history of the people, past and present, into what we call the salvation story. Now we don't want to trivialize it as if political rule is the end goal. No, that is not the end goal of any Christian. Rather, political rule, the left-hand kingdom, God, aligns to make way for God's complete reign in the person of Jesus. And so that first promise of comfort at the coming of the Lord, announced by his herald, the voice cried in the wilderness. And so today we are going to look at Isaiah through the eyes of, uh, we're going to study St. John through the eyes of Isaiah, the mighty seer, giving us a preview of the baptizer, who Jesus himself said is the greatest to be born of a woman. But why St. John is important? All the Gospels mention. It's the same John who jumped for joy while still in the womb at the arrival of the Virgin Mary who was with Holy Child. And his mother, being announced by John his arrival, says, and whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me. So even in the womb, St. John, the voice of the wilderness, announcing the arrival of the Lord. But it's not just somewhere in the past. You see, the Lord's herald still preaches today. He still preaches that you prepare a path that the Lord may enter with His saving grace, with His comforting grace. And so this prophecy applies to God's people in any age because it is the Lord who will vindicate His people. The Psalter promises us that He will have compassion on His servants, meaning He will comfort them. A comfort so wonderful, a comfort so nice that God has to tell it to us twice. He comforts them, those who have gone before us, He comforts us too because we too have sinned. We have all experienced the consequences of our sin. We need the comfort that His Word speaks to. We need the comfort His Word provides. And so, we ask that question, why do we need this comfort? And Isaiah tells us, he says, a voice says, cry. And I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, all its beauty is like the flower of the field, the grass withers. The flower fades, and the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God will stand forever. In all flesh, all of us, are grass. Think of how the grass looked back in the month of May and June. It was all green and lush and alive. And by the time, most times, December comes around, the grass turns brown, it withers, it dies, it stops growing. If you observe nature, especially the grass, you see that picture has a startling affinity to each one of us and our lives. What is happening to us and what will happen to us. We will all wither. Faith, we will all die. 
Do you know this? Do you feel it? Does it upset you? You see, we share this mortality, and it's a shared thing between all of us. It's a worldwide thing. There are no exceptions. Look around you. The people who were with us yesterday are not here today. Yeah, at the root of this dead and dying grass thing is sin. The reason we die is because we sin. And this is something we all share. Each one of us is born with that birth defect, passed down from our parents, the sinful nature inherited from Adam. It's a killer. Already it's a killer. But the thing is, we all go along with it. We grow up and we grow into sin. We enjoy it. Yes, sir. We enjoy it. And then we enjoy it some more. And then we do it. And then we enjoy it some more. You see, we don't want to listen to God. We'd rather do it on our own. You know that famous song, I did it my way. And that's a recipe for disaster. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. And there you go. There's the answer. The word of our God. The fact that He is our God. The fact that we know that He is our God is because of God's grace to begin with. That He reveals His word to us through the prophets, through the apostles and the Holy Scripture, preached to us and taught by God's servant today. And so this is a word that you can count on. God's word is sure. God's word is certain. It speaks to us today. It tells of the comfort that God has for us. And so then how do we prepare to receive this comfort? And that's our second question. Again, the mighty seer Isaiah has the answer. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up. Every mountain will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level. The rough places a plain, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. And all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Prepare the way of the Lord. Again, Isaiah prophesying the ministry of John the Baptist, the way prepared, the forerunner of our Lord, the voice crying in the wilderness of our sins. St. John came proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and the people thronged to him into the Jordan, confessing their sins. Isn't that how it should be? Isn't that St. John's teaching still holds good. His voice calls in the wilderness of our sin to recognize our sin and confess them, acknowledging that we have sinned against God. We deserve nothing but His punishment. You see, the baptizer proclaims the glory of the Lord revealed in Jesus, crucified for us. And then when the Son of Man shall be lifted up, He shall draw all nations to Himself that they may seek the comfort, the comfort that comes from the fruit of the tree, the crucifixion that pays for our sins. Now it's often observed that those who do not sense their sins actually do not have much desire for the comfort that God provides. But what about you? Do you feel, do you know your sins? your sinfulness. It is good and necessary that you do just as much as I do. So then maybe, have you gotten off track? Do you have a mountain of pride? Even a small little hill that needs to be brought low. Maybe there's just a little uneven ground there. Maybe some rough places. Maybe some rough edges. So is there a need for repentance? Yes. 
because repentance is an ongoing affair, a daily dying to sin, a daily rising with Christ. And this is the rhythm of baptized life. Repentance means to turn from death to life, to mourn for our sins of the damage we do to ourselves, the damage we do to others. But Jesus has the words of comfort. He says, blessed are those who mourn, but they shall be comforted. Those who mourn over their sins will have the comfort by God's grace. You see, Isaiah and John testify to the Lord. Jesus himself says, everything is about the grace I give to you. And so then, how does this grace and this comfort come? Again, the prophet Isaiah. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold his reward is with him. His recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead those that are with young. So my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, this is how it is for us. Victory over sin. Victory over death. We are at peace with God. Our sins are no longer held against us. Thanks be to God. Our good shepherd lays down his life for his flock. Now peace and righteousness kiss together. Peace and goodwill toward them. From their comfort, their Savior, their Lord Jesus Christ. His Death wins our forgiveness. His resurrection assures us of our rising from the dead. Not just our rising, all those we have lost on our pilgrimage. His life, His eternal life He shares with us forever. Is there a greater comfort that God can give to us? You see, our warfare is ended. Our iniquity is pardoned. We have received from the Lord's hand double for all our sins. Yes, double. Double the comfort. Double the grace. Double the salvation. Double the eternal life. Comfort. Comfort, Lord. Oh comfort that is so wonderful. Comfort that is so nice that God has to tell it to us twice. In the sweet name of Jesus, comfort, comfort us. Sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life.
Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness and bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear your words. Save and defend your holy church, purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Strengthen your faithful people through the word of the holy sacraments, making them perfect in love and in all good works, and establishing in them the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord, in your mercy, hear your words. Grant your wisdom and heavenly grace to all pastors and all those who hold office in your church. Especially, we pray for our President Timothy, our regional pastor Marvin, for myself as circuit counselor, and all of the pastors within our circuit and within our church, and the whole church throughout the world, that by their devoted service, faith may abound and the kingdom increase. Lord, in your mercy, in your, in your mercy, strengthen newly established congregations, support them in challenging times. Continue to hold your merciful grace upon this, your congregation. Especially pray for all those who are in need of prayer. For the afflicted, including Colin, Linda, Patrick, Rosie, Jordan, and Jose, Ivan, and Uta, Noah, Julia, Julia, Nathan, Robert, and Helen. Especially at the passing of their brother, Gerald, Marilyn, and family. Africa, Liz, Herb, Judy, Anne, Renata, Les, Lynn, Joanne, Bruce, Lorna, Pauline, Emma, Itana, <coughs> Jack, and Shirley, especially for Shirley as she has fallen down, grant to her grace. Mitch, Pastor James Luke, Richard, Beth's mother Lee and Aunt Alice, Sonia, Ruth, David, Gail, Rose, Fraser, Ben, Anupam, Pastor Bars, Renee, and all those we name now in the silence of our hearts. And for his name's sake, God will preserve not only their lives, but continue to keep our congregation and all other congregations established, that through them souls may be brought out of trouble and your word be proclaimed. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead peaceable lives with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially Charles, our King, the Governor General, Mary, Justin, our Prime Minister, the Parliament, the Government of this province, and all who have authority over us. Help them to serve as people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Sanctify our homes with your presence. Bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptism. Enable parents and all expecting mothers to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you in the church on earth and now rest from their labors. Keep in fellowship, keep us in fellowship with all your saints, and bring us at last to the joys of your heavenly kingdom, where the feast never ends. And so, Lord, as we partake of your holy body and blood, 
grant us faith and grant also to us the comfort that you have promised through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we may grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Evermore. 
You have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your son's body and blood. Keep us firm in the true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one Lord, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you